Hello, my name is Andy Hill, and I'm going to talk to you today about Worcester Dam. Uh, this is a case history examining the 1949 concentrated leak erosion incident uh, and is part of the Fundamentals of Internal Erosion class. We'll start with a little bit of background information on Worcester Dam, run through a timeline of the internal erosion incident, and then go through a node-by-node -node evaluation of concentrated leak erosion to determine the key factors that made CLE, or concentrated leak erosion, more likely and less likely during the event. Let's start with a little bit of background information. Worcester Dam is owned and operated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and is located near Worcester, Oklahoma. It's essentially a homogeneous embankment comprised of silty clays and clay silts with an average PI of nine, which were found to be dispersive after construction. It has random fill, seepage, and stability berms up, upstream and downstream. The random fill berms were comprised primarily of shale and sandstone from the required excavations. Finger drains were constructed over the downstream two thirds of the uh, embankment foundation to allow for consolidation of the embankment and overburden foundation soils during and after construction. The embankment was built on a shale foundation with no cutoff trench and without a grout curtain. Here's a plan view of the embankment. The Bateau River was diverted through the outlet works constructed to the right of the old riverbed. The closely spaced dashed lines perpendicular to the center line, highlighted in yellow, are the gravel finger drains. The finger drains were not placed in the location of the former riverbed because this was the only area where the overburdened soils were completely removed to rock. The foundation rock is composed of moderately soft, moderately hard shale with interbedded sandstone and siltstones. The rock dips about 28 degrees to the north along with the longitudinal axis of the dam. The thickness of the overburden in the floodplain ranges from 0 to 39 feet with an average of about 28 feet. The overburden consists of silty clays and clay silts with small sand lenses. Embankment construction through June 1948. Worcester Dam was authorized in 1938, but the notice to proceed for construction was not received until 1946, mostly to do with World War II. Most of the embankment and outlet works were constructed over about two years, shown here in plan and profile. This shows the construction accomplished through June 1948. Embankment construction, June through November, 1948. In June 1948, the Pateau River was diverted through the outlet works. Over the next six to seven months, the channel was filled and the closure, check, closure section of the embankment was constructed. The portion of the embankment shaded in blue was allowed to sit for 14 months prior to reservoir impoundment. The closure section, shaded in red, was, completely, was completed approximately one and a half to two months prior to reservoir impoundment. Now let's talk about the 1949 internal erosion incident that immediately followed construction. Here's a timeline of the incident. From 23 to 27 January 1949, 8.43 inches of rain fell in the watershed. On 28 January 1949, two days later, the reservoir crests at elevation 493.5, about 50% of the embankment height, after significant rainfall in the upstream basin, remains there for 12 hours and then slowly begins to fall. Two days later, leakage is observed in the, in the morning at station 9 plus 09 on the downstream slope, approximately 5 to 10 feet above the downstream toe of the slope. And a number of leaks develop later in the afternoon from station 4 plus 00 to 10 plus 00 with an estimated flow of 5 CFS. Three days later, the leakage volume increases and additional seeps appear between 10 plus 00 and 14 plus 40. Here's some observed leaks on the downstream face. This is a photograph from 1949 of one of 30 or more initial leaks that appeared on the downstream face of the dam at the closure section. The leakage appears to be carrying fine grain material. 
silhouettes of two people standing on the crest of the dam next to a car can be seen in the background. Timeline of incident continued. Leakage continues to increase and the flow is measured at 18 CFS. The discharge point at station 9 plus 09, the first one, climbs to elevation 478 feet. Exploratory drilling from the crest starts. On the next day, a hole appears on the upstream face of the embankment at station 2 plus 12 at elevation 485. Tracing dye exits the downstream face at 9 plus 09 at elevation 475 approximately 13 minutes later. Crust rock was placed in the hole, reducing the flow by about one third. Over the next three days, additional upstream erosion channels appear over several hundred feet, approximately at elevation 485. Finally, the reservoir level fall, begins to fall below the upstream erosion tunnels, essentially stopping the leakage and arresting the potential failure mode development. Leakage increases while head de decreases. In the photo on the left, the reservoir is at elevation 488.9 feet and falling, which is about four feet of hydraulic head above the upstream entrance location. In the photo on the right, the reservoir is at 485.8 and falling, which is about one foot of hydraulic head above the upstream entrance location. Although the hydraulic head difference has decreased by about three feet between the two photos, the leakage appears to increase significantly indicating the erosion pathways are increasing in size. Dye tracing. This is a plan view of the area around the old Pateau Riverbed, where the closure section was placed. The outlet works is located to the right of the old riverbed on the right side of the screen. The blue dots are located at the downstream leakage exit locations, and the red dots are located at the upstream entrances. It took 13 minutes for tracing dye placed at the upstream entrance locations to emerge from the leakage exits located 715 feet downstream. That's just under one foot per second. Here's the, at the bottom of the screen is the cross section of the embankment that shows a straight line between the elevation of the leakage entrance and the exit locations along this red dotted line. This is a 3D problem that really needs to be viewed in plan and profile to really understand. The failure path does not extend directly across the embankment, but was instead likely at an angle, generally following the old riverbed. The accuracy of the erosion pathway shown is not clear. The failure path was never excavated, so it's difficult to be sure what it really looked like. Here's the typical event tree for concentrated leak erosion. This section will step through each node in the event tree, starting with the flaw node. One node up front is that we're going to skip over the intervention node during this presentation. We have another case history that deals specifically with intervention. Evaluation of concentrated leak erosion. So what happened? Let's work through this internal erosion incident at Wester Dam, similar to how we would work through any CLE potential failure mode during a risk assessment by stepping through a typical CLE Entry. Flaw transverse crack. For the first node, what is the likelihood that a transverse or upstream to downstream crack exists in the embankment due to differential settlement? As with any typical event tree, the event tree and descriptions for each node can be reworked for each specific situation. In this case, the existing description for this node is appropriate. Flaw transverse crack. This figure is a profile along the center line of the dam looking upstream. The heavy black line shows the original interpreted top of rock surface. Some of the overburden was removed, but most was left in place as shaded in green. The light gray angled dash lines depict the, the dip of bedrock. The foundation profile in the red box will be examined more closely on the next slide. Flaw transverse crack. The top figure is a plan view of the area where the seeps and leaks occurred. The lower figure is a profile of the foundation downstream in the area of the old riverbed. Specifically, this profile drawing is a log of the sheet piles driven 118 feet upstream of the center line as a risk reduction measure or a method of intervention 
taken shortly after the leakage through the embankment began in order to try to arrest the leakage. The foundation stripping line is shown in blue. The old bed of the Pateau River is the low spot in the foundation stripping line near the center of the profile shown in red. The original interpretation of the rock surface on the right side of the Pateau Riverbed followed the foundation stripping line, now shown in blue. However, the logs of the sheet pile installation show the actual rock surface is deeper. Based on the new understanding of the location the downstream of the downstream rock surface, the profile would look like this. Instead of incompressible rock, there was 20 to 30 feet of compressible, silty clay alluvial material left in place. A large triangular area of compressible overburden material was left in place as shown on the plan view. This was verified by the exploratory boring hole A that was advanced after the start of the incident in 1949, which showed low plasticity clay down to an elevation of 431. Cracking due to differential settlement. Let's zoom back out a bit and look at this area with the seeps, leaks shown in blue and the internal erosion entrances shown in red. If we look at a profile along the center line of the embankment, we can get a better picture of what's causing this flaw. On the profile figure at the bottom, we can see that the well compacted fill of the embankment, shaded in brown, applying pressure to the soft, compressible overburden material, shaded in gray, as well as the well-compacted fill placed in the old Pateau riverbed. The difference in stiffness between the well-compacted riverbed fill and the compressible overburden resulted in a low stress zone, developing a crack and opening up. It's possible that this crack was continuous from upstream to downstream from the start or only part or most of the way across the embankment and was ultimately opened up as it was loaded by the rising reservoir level by hydraulic fracturing. Initiation. For node 2, what is the likelihood that sufficient hydraulic shear stress exists to initiate concentrated leak erosion in the crack? Initiation continued. The estimation of initiation of concentrated leak erosion involves both analytical methods and performance observations. This slide shows the concentrated leak erosion initiation toolbox output that can be used to inform the likelihood of initiation of concentrated leak erosion. The multicolored series of lines are the hydraulic shear stress as a function of crack width for different reservoir levels. For this case history, the reservoir levels of interest range from peak reservoir elevation of 493.5 to elevation 485, which was the entrance location of the pipes. The rectangular box bounds the estimates of crack width, shown by the red arrows, and the critical shear stress for the embankment, shown by the blue arrows. The critical shear stress can be informed by the erodibility parameters toolbox, and the crack width can be informed by the concentrated leak erosion crack width and depth toolbox. Both of these toolboxes will be demonstrated and used in an exercise later. The mean refers to the expected value of critical shear stress and crack width, based on the input distribution, and the mode refers to the most likely value or best estimate. From this figure, the reservoir level and crack width needed to exceed a given critical shear stress can be estimated. Initiation of erosion is assumed to occur when the critical shear stress is exceeded. For example, the hydraulic shear stress imposed by reservoir elevation 493.5, the purple line, exceeds the mean critical shear strength, stre shear strength and mean crack width, the green dot. The hydraulic shear stress at 492 is about equal, and the hydraulic shear stress at 490.5 does not exceed it. Therefore, based on mean values, initiation of erosion is not predicted at, predicted at reservoir elevation 490.5, but is for 493.5. For the best estimate or mode parameters, blue dot, initiation of erosion is predicted for all reservoir levels above elevation 485 because the hydraulic shear stress in the crack exceeds the best estimate of the critical shear stress and crack width, which is consistent with the observed performance back in 1949.
some additional factors that could have acted in concert or by themselves to affect the likelihood of initiation include the possibility that there were defects having to do with the gravel trenches at the foundation contact. There could have been damage in the form of desiccated uh, desiccation, excuse me, to the protective fill placed over the drains prior to placement of the embankment closure section that could have led to a flaw as well, or saturation settlement could have occurred. Continuation. For node 3, what is the likelihood that an unfiltered exit exists allowing erosion to continue? As shown in the embankment cross section, there was no chimney or downstream filter included in the original embankment design. The random fill berms where the leakage exits located were located were comprised primarily of shale and sandstone, which did not provide any filtering action. Therefore, there was an unfiltered exit at the time of the internal erosion incident. Progression, roof formation. For node four, what is the likelihood that a continuous stable roof forms over the crack and stable sideways, are, excuse me, side walls are maintained along the crack? The impervious fill used to construct the homogeneous embankment material has an average fines content of about 70%, and the fines have some plasticity, making it virtually certain for the crack to hold a roof and stable sidewalls continuously from upstream to downstream. This is consistent with what was observed in 1949, where leakage and erosion continued until the reservoir elevation was lowered below the erosion tunnels. Progression. For nodes 5 and 6, what is the likelihood that the upstream zoning fails to limit flows into the crack? And what is the likelihood that upstream zoning fails to self-heal the crack? Therefore, both of these progression nodes required an upstream zone for flow limitation and crack filling action. As shown in the embankment cross section, this is essentially a homogeneous embankment dam comprised of silty clays and clay silts. There are no upstream zones or facing elements that could limit flows from the reservoir to arrest erosion by reducing hydraulic shear stresses below critical values. Similarly, there is no upstream zone that can transport particles into the cracks or developing pipes and eventually seal the filter. And if there were, there are no downstream filters or transitions to trap those eroded particles. There is a layer of riprap and bedding stone on the upstream slope, but it's thin and likely to likely fell to the bottom of the crack. This is consistent with what was observed during the 1949 event when there was no slowing of leakage or erosion until the reservoir was lowered below the erosion tunnels. Unsuccessful intervention. Breach was averted only because the reservoir level dropped below the entrance to the pipes. The, this incident was a near miss with respect to failure. After the reservoir level was lowered, the entrances to the pipes were plugged. Immediate remedial measures consisted of installing a sheet pile wall through the closure section of the embankment performing extensive grouting and installing additional upstream and downstream berms. Breach. For node eight, the last node in the inventory, what is the likelihood that uncontrolled release of the reservoir occurs? If intervention had not been successful, Worcester Dam would have almost certainly breached by gross enlargement of the leakage pipes, leading to collapse of the overlying embankment and overtopping. Fortunately, breach was averted because the reservoir was lowered by, uh, below the erosion tunnels before arresting the, the failure mode development. Some gross enlargement was likely occurring because the erosion rate was increasing even as the reservoir level was decreasing, as shown in the photos earlier in the presentation. More and less likely factors. Now that we've stepped through each node in the event tree, let's take a look at the summary of more and less likely factors for a concentrated leak erosion potential failure mode. Likelihood factors. It's often helpful to think of more and less likely factors by nodes in the event tree, which is why you see the different colors on the slide. I'm gonna give you guys a second to read through these, just as some examples for more and less likely factors for a concentrated leak erosion failure mode. And here are some references. 
Sherrard's 1986 paper, Hydraulic Fracturing and Embankment Dams. Sherrard's 1973 paper, Embankment Dam Cracking. And the USACE Project Completion Report and Construction of Worcester Dam and Appurtenances, uh, a project report out of Tulsa District. Thanks for your attention, and if there's any questions, comments, or discussion, uh, we'll take those now. Thanks.